Well, good morning and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for this beautiful conference. I've um, very much enjoyed it and uh, I, I also want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, the help of my graduate student, Yan Lee, and also support from NSF. Let's see, it's not on. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank Mark Torrent and Francois Jolet for a wonderful collaboration all these many years. So uh, this work was um, stimulated by some work that Yan did. Uh, uh, she's a very careful uh, scientist and uh, she uh, was getting the, the questions we usually want to answer, what are stable materials, what are the stable structures, and so on. And we want to line up with experiments, so we would like our calculations to be reliable. And many of the materials that she was finding, um, studying with quantum espresso, turned out to have uh, um, imaginary phonons. And the question was, is that real or not? So we decided to check the results with Abinet, and many of those um, uh, imaginary phonons went away for her materials. So the question is, what is causing this? And, and so what we want to do is try to enumerate and test some of the contributing factors that, that, that go into these uh, uh, properties. And I decided not to use her materials, but a, a simpler one, cubic and hexagonal boron nitride, just as a test. And along the way, we also encountered some trouble with our data sets uh, that surprised us that I'll share with you briefly. Um, so you've already heard from Don Hammond about uh, different formalisms. Uh, he talked about the norm-conserving pseudopotentials. We also, we, we tend to use the projector augmented wave formalism, so that is a factor. Uh, we, we also have different data sets. Uh, uh, for each formalism, there are many sources of data sets. And then what surprised us, we thought that it was uh, what was controlling the accuracy was the atomic data sets, but it is also uh, coming out that there are the details of the implementations that come into to the accuracy there. Um, so um, the data sets come from many places. As you know, uh, we used uh, the norm-conserving pseudopotentials available on the pseudo-dojo. I, I guess we're going to hear about that later. Uh, uh, from the Abinet website, uh, uh, the JTH set uh, uh, developed by Francois Jolet is available, and we do share some from our Adam PAW uh, website, although it's not very extensive. Uh, let's see. Oh, great. Uh, and, and the two codes that we want to compare are Abinet and Quantum Expresso. Uh, just for um, uh, notation, I use the ONC for Don's uh, optimized norm-conserving pseudopotentials, the JTH set uh, from the Abinet website, and we also uh, made some ourselves. And uh, I, I want to also compare Abinet and Quantum Expresso. Now, uh, I know... Um, it seems to be the consensus that I should be using PBE, but for this work we used the LDA uh, exchange correlation functional. So we decided uh, to um, use uh, boron nitride as our, our, our example just uh, to, to make this study. It's one data point, but um, it has some interesting things. It turns out not to illustrate all of the issues, but some of them anyway. So, so boron nitride exists in many forms, and mainly the cubic form, which is, is a, a, a zinc blend structure, and the hexagonal form. Um, now, uh, at least in the density functional simple calculations, uh, 
without van der Waals corrections, um, the, the cubic form is, is the ground state and the hexagonal is, is a little bit higher um, in energy, although uh, there is some discussion about that and some interesting physics that might be explored, but that's not the purpose of this talk. Um, so what we did was to uh, make a convergence study um, with these three different pseudopotential data sets, the norm conserving in black, the JTH set in red, and ours in green. Um, the full line represents uh, Abinet, and the dashed line represents Quantum Expresso. And what's interesting to us is that uh, we, um, that between Abinet and Quantum Expresso, the convergence properties are, are quite different. Um, the norm conserving pseudopotential uh, is well converged at 80 Rydbergs in, in, on this scale, um, where the um, uh, PAW data sets converge uh, at an earlier point. Um, and uh, I did find in the literature that uh, there was an early VASP calculation. Um, they used, at that time, uh, ultra-soft pseudopotentials. They had a very small cutoff, um, but they also got a, a, a essentially the same answer. This is a very large scale, so the difference is, is in uh, milli heart, uh, milli Rydberg. Uh, no, really, milli EV, sorry. Uh, just one, ah, right. <laughs> um, uh, comment, uh, 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 this one milli EV difference uh, is largely due to the fact that we, uh, for the atomic solver, use the uh, Schrodinger equation rather than the scalar relativistic equation. That uh, puts us in, in that range of uh, difference there. But in addition to the uh, convergence of the energy difference um, is the convergence of the optimized lattice constants. And there, too, you see that both Abinet and Quantum Expresso have different convergence properties uh, that uh, they, they don't track uh, the same convergence. They, they have different uh, rates of convergence and different values uh, at uh, their non-converged values. But this is, again, a very large scale, so the differences um, uh, are uh, 10 to minus 3 angstrom, so perhaps beyond what we expect to be meaningful. Um, now, in the case of the hexagonal lattice, the in-plane lattice constant uh, has the same uh, sort of um, deviation as the cubic lattice constant, um, but the hex hexagonal, the c-axis, of course, is, is much uh, softer forces. Uh, in reality, there's probably a little bit of van der Waals forces going on, and so there's a lot of deviation there uh, uh, for the c-axis. We also looked at the phonons. Now, um, for Jan's projects, that was the focus, that we were getting um, the wrong... Um, oh, I have zero hours? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I don't know how much more time I have. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so for, the, um, uh, for Jan's project, uh, she was concerned that she was getting the imaginary modes, and, and uh, that was the issue here. For this simple system, we see that uh, for the cubic phase, uh, th this is just for the one uh, uh, data set that we constructed at Wake Forest. Um, that's perfectly converged even at uh, 40 uh, Rydberg cutoff. 
Um, for the hexagonal phase, which is a little more complicated structure, uh, you see that uh, at 40 Rydberg structure um, cutoff, you do see these imaginary modes and uh, just a very small deviation um, at, uh, 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 at the 60 cutoff. At 80 cutoff, everybody agrees. Um, we, we also did this with the norm-conserving uh, pseudopotential at convergence, and everybody agrees um, uh, with the phonons. For quantum espresso, uh, the convergence is a little bit different um, for the phonons, uh, but also uh, at uh, 60 degrees, uh, 60 Rydberg cutoff, everybody agrees with the phonons. <clears throat> but the takeaway message here is that uh, um, that the more complicated structures, everybody probably knows this, but for the more complicated structures, they're e harder to converge the, the phonon structure. And in the literature, you do see um, publications with imaginary phonons. Um, this is one uh, on boron nitride, uh, where these are spurious due to the numerics. Um, that uh, 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 could probably be avoided if you used a higher cutoff or better pseudopotentials. Now, why we did all this, uh, we, we typically want to, to know what is the uh, uh, stability of the material at room temperature and uh, so we need to calculate the free energy, that is to add the vibrational free energy to, to the static lattice effects. Now the static lattice effects, since it's insulator, uh, is more or less temperature independent, and uh, adding the vibrational uh, uh, free energy, uh, we can uh, find a free energy curve as a function of temperature. And uh, for this example, um, uh, this was performed at a, a cutoff of 80 uh, Rydbergs. The uh, norm-conserving results and the uh, PAW results uh, agree very nicely. And probably this difference is perhaps traced back to the fact that we didn't use scalar relativistic uh, atomic solver in the beginning. Uh, right. Okay, uh, I just want to mention one other uh, aspect of, of, of uh, the accuracy issue. Uh, we've uh, had this atomic solver for many years and shared data on our website, and uh, we were very uh, um, worried when we discovered that uh, it is possible to get crazy results <laughs> if, if you're not careful. Um, uh, so last summer we were calculating phonons of using quantum espresso, and uh, for example, uh, for sodium chloride um, uh, with quantum espresso, we got crazy phonons um, for a data set that we had been sharing on our, data, uh, on our um, website for many years. Um, compared with Abinet. Abinet gave the right, uh, uh, this is the densest phonon states, uh, the red one is quantum espresso, and uh, uh, the black one is Abinet, and the question was why. And um, so what we, we, we wasted a lot of time trying to figure it out. It turned out that it was traced to a detail in the implementation of the two codes, and uh, it had to do with how do you calculate uh, the exchange correlation energy. In Abinet, uh, uh, for many years now, they used the local formalism by default, and uh, that involves uh, calculating the exchange correlation energy of the pseudo energy, uh, pseudo density, that is the valence density and the 
um, smooth core density, whereas in um, quantum espresso, they're using a formulation uh, introduced by Cressa and VASP, um, where they add to this density uh, the compensation charge density. Now, in my opinion, it doesn't belong there. It does belong in, in the Hartree uh, term because you need to get the, the Coulombic right, uh, energy correct, but it doesn't logically de uh, belong in the exchange correlation energy. And uh, we wrote a paper about this uh, about 10 years ago and, and forgot about it. And it turns out, uh, in the case of chlorine data set, uh, the, this compensation charge happened to be negative. And it allowed, for certain regions of space, this, this argument to be negative. And that was terrible, because the code, uh, when you give the exchange correlation uh, energy a negative number, it usually puts zero. and about, and, and cause some discontinuities, um, and uh, therefore uh, that that explained uh, the problem. There is a very good remedy uh, to 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 make sure, prepare your data sets to sort of ensure that this never is negative, and our new version of the code does correct that uh, uh, problem. Uh, so hopefully I have not destroyed anybody's life by sharing wrong pseudo-potentials <laughs> all these years. <laughs> but um, we, we recently published that in, in um, physics co uh, communication, uh, computational physics communications. So uh, just, uh, I, I just, uh, this is only a very, um, simple uh, example of the pitfalls of, of coding. Um, it's, in my opinion, very uh, important to have multiple codes uh, that you can uh, compare your results. Had we only one code, we would have gone round the wrong path and, and never <laughs> figured out what was going on. So thank you to all you developers for, for providing these public domain codes that people can use, hopefully correctly. <laughs> and uh, 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 the other point is that I would encourage all of us who, who, who work with other users to to be skeptical uh, when they get a result that doesn't make sense to try to trace it. Those are usually the interesting cases. Maybe it, in this case, it wasn't any physics. It was just a numerical quirk. But uh, they all, always should be traced. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.